please do uh, take seats. Um, before we have our reading, uh, just going to introduce a little bit about our new series that we're looking at. Uh, first of all, if you've not met before, uh, my name's Liam. Uh, I'm one of the leaders here at City Gates Church. It's really good to have you with us here tonight, whether you're here in person or you're watching online. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, yeah, we're in the book of Mark of the next three weeks. Basically, Mark is a gospel, an account of Jesus' life. Uh, and if Mark was kind of written into like a, a film or a TV series, then the genre of it would probably be action or thriller or something like that, basically because it is such a fast-paced book. It's action-packed. The, key, the scene keeps on changing. Mark often starts, this happens, and then this happens, and then Jesus went here, and he sees all these stories kind of put together. Uh, he even starts the book with these words. They'll come up on screen. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah the son of God. Now, there's a term in uh, journalism when someone's writing a newspaper article. Uh, there's a term called bearing the leads. If you're bearing the lead of the story, maybe you've, you've heard that expression before. Maybe it means nothing. But basically, it's often when journalists, they might put in the most important detail into the story further on in rather than leading with it. It's buried. It's further on in into the story. And you're reading through the story and you get to it and you're like, wait a minute. That's the, big, that's the big deal. That's the main point of the story. Well, Mark is definitely not doing that here. He puts the headline, what he wants the headline of his book to be, it is front and center for everyone to see. He is saying, this is who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of God. He's good news. And I'm going to show you why in my account of his life. And so over the next three weeks, we're going to look at this section that's right in the middle of this book. You see, Mark structures his book in a deliberate way that show us different themes that fit together and that run through the entire book as well. And here what he's doing is he's kind of almost showing us the experiences of some of Jesus' disciples. They were basically Jesus' closest followers. He's inviting us to go on a journey with them. He's inviting us to walk in their footsteps to see what they saw. And at the center of all this is the, this question that Jesus himself asks his disciples. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? It's a question that right at the center of the book, really, it kind of splits the gospel of Mark in two. Who do you say I am? It's a question for the disciples. But it's also a question for us, too, the people reading the accounts of his life. Who do you think Jesus is? That's the question that I want us to have just ringing in our ears as we look at this section over the next few weeks. Now, whether you're here or you feel really familiar with who Jesus is, or perhaps you're just looking into Jesus for the first time, working out what you think, all of us in the room are on the same page because all of us are invited to consider who Jesus is. And so we're going to start tonight um, by looking at our first passage. Uh, You can find that on page 1011 in these red uh, church Bibles. And James is going to come up and read it for us. Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 26. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. And they have, they have already been with me for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. 
Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? They came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spat on the man's eyes and he put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his height was, sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, James, for, for reading. Please do um, just keep your Bibles open. We'll be looking at this story as we go through it. We'll be looking at what different verses say. It's really helpful to keep your Bible open uh, with you. Uh, let me pray for us and before we look more um, at this passage. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that as we've sang tonight that you are the, the word of God, the Father, Lord, that Jesus is the one who shows us what God is like and what he has come to do. Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes, Lord. You'd help us to see who Jesus is. Who do you say I am is the question asked in Mark's gospel. Lord, we pray that we might see clearly more and more that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that you would help us to see what that looks like for us in our lives, Lord, as we consider more of him, his beauty, his compassion for others, his loving salvation that he has given us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you can tell, the, the, kind of the theme of the series is seeing Jesus. What do we see when we look at his word? And what is Mark trying to give our attention to? Are we seeing clearly or are we seeing but not really properly seeing? We're not really looking. Uh, let me give you kind of an example of what this can look like um, in my life. When I'm called to kind of look for something, you know, Laura might say, can you go find this? I will often be looking but not really kind of looking. And so I'll look everywhere. I'll say, is it you know, in these cupboards, in these drawers here? Is it in this room over here? I'll come back and I'll say, Lauren, I looked everywhere, but I couldn't find it. And here's what she'll often say. She'll say, did you look or did you do a Liam look? Uh, let me tell you, like, that, that's not a compliment. To do a Liam look is not a compliment. Now, I have an option there, don't I? I could say, you know, I could only go, do you know what? I probably could have looked harder. I'll look again. But do I do that? No, of course not. I double down and say, yes, of course I looked. And she'll say, did you look here? I told you to look here. Yeah, I did look there. And, you know, she'll go and be like, here's the thing I was looking for. Where was it? Is where I told you it was going to be. Ah. Sometimes we can look but not really see. And that's a sense of what is going on in our passage tonight. Have you really looked? Mark is asking us. Do you really see? Jesus here is inviting us to see who he really is and not be distracted. Remember, Mark, he structures his book in a certain way. These stories are kind of ordered in a certain way, a series of challenges to the reader to decide who Jesus is. We're led to consider who he really is. And so let's dive in as we see the first of our stories and we see who Jesus is from this story. Jesus is the one who provides with compassion in verses one to 10. So let's kind of set the scene Jesus is away from all the, the big cities. Remember, he's going around telling people that the kingdom of God has come. But here he is, out in the sticks, out in the wilderness. And yet there is a large crowd with him, at least 4,000 people present. And in verse 2, Jesus identifies a massive problem. He says these words, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry... They will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. 
Can you imagine if this story happened today? You see, if this incident was being reviewed, then Jesus probably would have failed every health and safety requirement going. You see, the crowd gathers, they're following Jesus, they're desperate to hear more of his teaching. They've nearly run out of food, though, and they have nowhere to go to go try and buy some. And the situation is pretty bleak. If Jesus sends them away, they will collapse on the way home. Jesus is basically going to be liable for a lot of lawsuits here. And so we see in this story, Jesus provides for them in a miraculous way. These seven loaves and some fish, they're distributed around. And in verse 8, we can see the outcome of what happened. The people ate and were satisfied. They're right at the bottom of the page. You see, they're not just given enough food just to keep them going for, for their way home. There's an abundance. These people are on a picnic where they couldn't eat another mouthful. And we can see they even got some more for the journey home because the disciples pick up seven basketfuls of broken pieces. You see, they, they are enjoying this feeling of fullness. The people enjoy here, they, they go from hunger and desperation to satisfaction and contentedness. And that was a physical reality, reality for them, but here Jesus is showing them it's part, a picture of a greater spiritual reality. I'm sure we can all relate to that feeling where you've had a meal, you've been really ready for it, you're hungry for it, and the meal promises to really satisfy your hunger. And so you're really excited in anticipation. You eat the meal, but then maybe just an hour, two hours later, you're left disappointed because you still feel hungry. The meal has not satisfied. You see, what we can do is take that, that feeling and apply it to all of life. In life when we sometimes feel without meaning or purpose, we're left dissatisfied, aren't we, with the things of life that promised to deliver. They do not give that lasting contentment that we so want. Wherever you may look for it, in the perfect job, the perfect career, the perfect house, perfect family life, perfect social life, we live in a world where all of these things promise to give us satisfaction. If only we could just reach out and grab them. And yet we're left just grasping at thin air. We're left in a wilderness just like the people are here. And yet Jesus famously, he describes himself as the bread of life, providing for all the one and only lasting answer to that lack of contentment that we can all feel. And here is what he's doing in this miracle. Mark is making a point that this is available and on offer to all people. Now, maybe you read this story and thought, hang on, wasn't it 5,000 people that Jesus fed? What happened there? Well, this is a similar miracle. It's a separate event, different story. But there are some key differences that show us more about who Jesus is. And here is the big difference. Notice where this takes place. You see, feeding the 5,000 back in Mark 6, that took place in Jewish territory. I appreciate the map's not super clear, but here... We can see earlier on in chapter 7, verse 31, Jesus is in the region of the Diacopolis. Basically, this is Gentile territory. That basically means people who weren't Jewish, people who weren't part of God's people from the Old Testament. So Jesus is in this area, and yet Mark starts his gospel by saying the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. He is saying Jesus is good news for all people. All people can come and know him because he provides for all people. Whoever you are, whatever your backgrounds, whatever life has looked like for you, Jesus is the one who provides. To know Jesus does not mean that you first need to be in some kind of special club. Whether you've kind of grown up going to church or really just wanted nothing to do with Jesus before tonight, his offer of real, lasting satisfaction is on offer and open to all. And so is Jesus' compassion. That's on offer to all as well. We, in verse 2, we can see his character. He says, I have compassion on these people, not just because they're hungry and they need a meal, but because they're people in need of spiritual help. In Mark chapter 6, people who need this kind of meal, they're described like sheep, Without a shepherd, they do not have someone looking after them, caring for them, protecting them. They are in danger. 
These are people who have exhausted their limits in life. They turn to Jesus as their only hope. But will it just be for the provision of a free meal? Or will it be for true and lasting hope beyond death that this meal is pointing us towards? That's a question that Mark is posing to us. What do you make of Jesus' offer here? Will you take it up? Will you truly see? Second thing that we see as we go on to the next story is Jesus, the one who people fail to see in verses 11 to 21. You see, what Mark is doing here in this kind of story, and particularly here, he's also almost kind of inviting us to take a spiritual eye test. Maybe you've taken an eye test kind of recently, Specsavers, Vision Express, wherever it is. Maybe you're due on soon. Uh, or maybe, you know, you've got that letter somewhere on your fridge that says, you need to take an eye test. You need to catch up on it. Basically, you know, often when you go for an eye test and you kind of put on those, that massive kind of like machine thing and look through different things and you look at a chart like the one on the left and you work out kind of what letters there are and you kind of squint and they ask you, what line? Can you read this line here? And you're like, yeah, D or maybe P, I'm not sure. I'm taking a guess. And, and then you look at the balloon as well and they're like, number one or number two? Number one or number two? Mark here is kind of almost giving us this kind of spiritual eye test in a sense. He's saying, do, can you really see? Do you really see who Jesus is? Or do you fail to truly see? You see, after this miracle, word would have spread about who Jesus is. They'd be asking, who is this Jesus? He provided bread for us in the wilderness. That reminds us of Moses. We're looking at that account in Exodus in our morning service. Could he be greater than Moses? Could he be the Messiah? And here, in this section, Mark shows us two responses to who Jesus is. And what he's done here is highlight two ways that people can fail to see who he is. Two ways for us to avoid. The first one of these, the demands of a hardened heart. In verses 11 and 12. Now we can see, basically, word reaches these people called the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, they were basically the religious leaders, elite of their day. They hated Jesus. And so we can see in verse 11 that they come to him, began to question him. Now here, there's not the tone of wanting to, to learn and to hear more about who Jesus is. They are coming with a loaded agenda. They want to question Jesus. They want to accuse him. They want to pin him up into a corner. And we can see what their real motives are. In the middle of that verse, 11, it says, to test him. They want to test Jesus. They want to put him on the ropes, hope he slips up. What does it say that they want to see? Well, they're asking for a sign from heaven, demanding it, almost treating Jesus like a performing monkey. Well, let's consider what's really going on here. Because the reality is that Jesus did perform signs from heaven, but these signs weren't meant to be just impressive acts to kind of boost Jesus' reputation. They were designed to point people beyond Jesus, to show people what he'd come to do and what it is like to live in God's world. What it is like to live in his kingdom. And yet, what the Pharisees are doing here in their, in their cynicism, they're trying to exploit Jesus, trying to leverage his signs for their own terms and their own gain. They're trying to take what Jesus is doing through these signs and basically just kind of dumb them down to make their own point. Now we might say, well, Jesus, why didn't he just, you know, just do a sign, just kind of like get them off his back? Well, for one, we've already seen, like he's literally just done a sign. He's fed 4,000 people with a family meal. Secondly, the Pharisees, they've already been witness to some of Jesus' miracles. Back in Mark chapter 3, they were there when he heals a man with a withered hand in the very temple of the Pharisees. And yet they still didn't believe. They're asking for something that they refuse to see in front of their very eyes. And thirdly, we can see Jesus knows their hard-heartedness. 
We can see that in his response in verse 12. It's one of not just frustration, but just mourning. It's, it's grief. He cries out, why does this generation ask for a sign? He has great sadness at their hard-heartedness that they refuse to see who Jesus is. We can see something of that today. Maybe you've heard something like this from friends, or perhaps you know, you're thinking about this as well. You might think something like, do you know what, I, I believe in Jesus when he really shows himself to me. You know, just, I believe in God. If He just showed me this sign that was just undeniable right in front of me. But until then, I just can't be sure. You see, something like that, well, said in the most genuine way, it is probably more similar to the Pharisees than we'd like to think. You see, so often we'll be, what we're doing there is we're saying that we want God to reveal himself to us on our terms. We're saying... I'll be the judge, thank you. Why does that really make a difference to us? It neglects to see just the entirety, of God's word, who Jesus is himself. All of this is God coming down to us, showing us himself. He's the creator of the universe, becoming a broken human so that we might see who Jesus really is. All of this is a sign to us. And yet, we want more. You see, we need to respect his terms and consider what he has already given us. And so perhaps one next step that you can take if you're considering who Jesus is, take a gospel. Read one of these. We've got some downstairs on our welcome desk. Do take one and read it for yourself. Consider who Jesus is. See, Jesus says that you can come to God with humbleness, with humility, not hard-heartedness. If you come with humility, asking God to reveal his truth to you then he will do that through his word, seeing Jesus more. But the warning is here. Don't be like a Pharisee who claimed to be seeking a sign, but really, do you know what? They're not interested. They're hard-hearted. They've already made up their mind. They will not be moving. The second uh, response we see is the dullness of a hardened heart. That's the second response we see from Jesus' disciples in verses 14 to 21. You see, if again, if this is like a, a spiritual eye test, well, the Pharisees are the ones who are refusing to take the eye test. But the disciples here, they're the ones that are indecisive. Number one or number two? Number one or number two? Sorry, can you do it again? Can I see number one again? Yep, number one, number two. Number one, number two. You see, the evidence is right there in front of them but they're still not clear on who Jesus is. And we can see that Jesus warns them. Have a look at verse 15. Jesus says, be careful. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Here he is saying to them, watch out, be on your guard. Watch out for those who are hard-hearted. Do not be like them. Just as yeast affects the whole loaf of bread, hard-heartedness can affect the whole of you too. And so perhaps you can imagine the scene that Jesus says this to his disciples and they kind of nod along like, yeah, 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 taking that in, Jesus. As soon as Jesus is gone, they're turning to one another thinking, what does that mean? They're, with, they're panicking. So what they do is they put their heads together. They think, oh yeah, we, we're just there where Jesus kind of fed loads of people with bread and you know, we've got kind of this loaf of bread with us here and yeah, he mentioned something about yeast and they think, oh, do you know what Jesus is saying here? We don't have any bread. That's what they come to in verse 16. It is because we have no bread. Jesus here is telling us that when we get to the shops, we need to go and buy some bread. Maybe get some hoes or some king's mill in. Now Jesus is the one of great compassion and kindness. But even here, he is probably starting to tear his hair out, isn't he? Have a look at verse 17. He's saying, why are you talking about having no breads. He's saying, guys, it's not about the breads. It is not about the breads. It's that feeling of perhaps two people talking, and they think they're talking on the same level, but really they're completely just talking past one another. You see, the Pharisees, they are blind, and so are the disciples here, but in a very different way. 
You see, the disciples, they, they look up to the sky and demand a sign. And the disciples look down to what they have in their hands and they think about bread. The Pharisees are demanding a sign. And really, what the disciples are doing, their heart is hard too because they can't see beyond just the material world and stuff around them. They really do think it's all about bread. You see, the disciples, they've been there for Jesus' miracles and yet they just haven't grasped what they're really about. They should be starting to kind of connect the dots to what they've heard about Jesus, and yet they still don't understand. As Jesus says, they have eyes and ears, but they do not see or hear. Just as Jesus warns them, we need to take care as well to make sure that our hearts are not hardened to Jesus in a similar way. You see, it's not quite as confrontational as demanding a sign from Jesus. But this hardness of heart of not looking beyond just the material world means that we will miss out on who Jesus is too. It's almost like we'll only see a 2D version of Jesus and we will miss out on the true reality. One way we could do that, perhaps we, we look an account of Jesus' life and we come to the conclusion, yeah, Jesus, well, you know, he was a good guy and perhaps was just a moral teacher or maybe an interesting historical figure or maybe we think, Jesus had a lot of good things to say, maybe to help me live a better life. But if that is the conclusion we come to, if that's all he is, then Mark is saying here, we will miss out on who Jesus really is. We will miss out. We will claim to see, but not really see at all. What will help us to see Jesus more clearly? Well, it's not going to be from just disregarding the eye test and trying to settle it on our own terms. And it's not going to be from trying to squint more and, and taking a guess about what we can see. We need something greater, something different, something to help us see clearly. If this is a spiritual eye test, then Jesus is the one who gives the true prescription we need. He is the one who gives sight to the blinds. Our final section of this story in verses 22 to 26. Remember, we're still in Gentile, non-Jewish territory. And Jesus comes to a town where his friends, uh, they've led this blind man to come and be healed. Now in this culture, being blind was often considered as a result of sin, either your own or your family's sin. And so we can only imagine what life would have been like for this man. Blinded, just separated from society no one wanted anything to do with him to be near him was to just to be considered unclean to be sinful and yet wonderfully we see jesus compassion here have a look at how he leads the man with with real tenderness away from you know the busyness of the village the fact that he is even just touching this man who is almost condemned to be sinful Let's have a look. Verse 23 at the miracle itself. When he had spat on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. And we might read that story and one question that kind of pops into our heads is, why does Jesus have to do it again? Why, why does it happen in two stages? You know, did Jesus kind of fail to do it first time around and had to awkwardly have another go? Well, we know that Jesus is clearly capable of us to do this. I mean, he's literally just fed 4,000 people with a few loaves of bread. He's walked on water. I think why this is here is, well, firstly, it shows us the authenticity of how this happens. Mark is not embarrassed by this story and thinks, oh, I should probably just edit that detail out to make it appear different. But the main reason, I think, is its metaphorical value. This man's physical blindness is a picture of spiritual blindness, particularly the disciples. They would have been there witnessing this event. Remember, they are blind to who Jesus really is. Perhaps that's what this shows us, that how this man's sight is 
is healed in stages from kind of seeing nothing at first to just seeing kind of figures walking around, like able to see, but sort of blurry, not being able to make it out, and then able finally to see fully, to see everything clearly. He is able to see his friends and family, his life in full technicolor. Remember, Mark is deliberate about what story he includes and where. So it's no coincidence that this story follows on from the conversation that he has had with his disciples, where the main topic has been about whether they see him or not. It's almost like the Pharisees, they're going on this journey of realization, seeing who Jesus is, just as this man regains his sight in stages. One day the Pharisees will see clearly, but for now they see Jesus, but they only see him in blurriness. Despite even being with Jesus, hearing his teaching, witnessing the many miracles and signs, they are still slow to understand, slow to see clearly who Jesus is. You see, just as the blind man needed the help of Jesus to see, the disciples and us too need Jesus' help to help us see clearly too, spiritually. Throughout our, our section tonight and, and often through the Gospels, there is this warning of not seeing Jesus clearly. I think that's why Jesus kind of ends this story in verse 26. He says to the man who's just healed, sending him home, perhaps this man doesn't live in the village, but he's saying, don't even go near the village. Don't even go into it. Don't go and tell people which might sound something weird to us, but I think the way that Jesus has done this miracle, just sort of in private, away from the village and all that business, it shows Jesus' awareness to how people could get a wrong and distorted view of who he is. They'll get mixed up, and we see that throughout the gospel. Jesus is concerned that people don't get the wrong impression of who he is, that he's just some kind of powerful healer, a miracle worker, but not a Messiah. He wants them to make sure that they do not get the wrong impression, to see him clearly. He does not want his reputation to go before him in a way that blinds people to who he is, that his real mission, his real identity, wouldn't get lost at the cost of just like speculation and hype of healing people. It might rise for a time, but then just kind of quickly fade. See, as we're invited to consider who Jesus is, Mark is showing us, he poses the question to us, who do you think Jesus is? We can see that there can be the same of having this wrong view of Jesus. And often that can be almost worse the case than having no view of Jesus at all. You see, if we, we claim to see Jesus, but we don't really have any greater value of him other than just a spiritual looking mascot, that we turn to, then we are blind too. That we see, but we don't really see at all. And the danger of this view would be that we come to Jesus just looking for a quick fix to our, our self-diagnosed condition, but it is not dealing with the real issue itself. As Mark shows us who Jesus is, he doesn't really leave it for us to decide. That, you know, it would be quite a modern, postmodern way of reading this gospel. He's saying, hey, look at the evidence and you decide who Jesus is. There's no real kind of one truth about it. Mark is wanting to be really clear about who Jesus is. And we're going to see next week in our next section, Mark invites us to consider who Jesus is and shows us that we can only do this in light of the cross. Seeing everything about Jesus through this perspective. Because he is the one that has come to, to feed us, but to give us everlasting life, doing it through his death in our place. And he's come to show us who he is, but we only see that fully through the cross. He's come to open the eyes of the blind, to give spiritual sight. He will do that through his Holy Spirit. And we can know life, true full, satisfying life, life to the full through him. And so I invite you just as we've done tonight, please do come back next week and the week after as we think about who Jesus is. But let's close by just dwelling on that question. Do I truly see who Jesus is? 
Or do I need help to pray that God might give us eyes to see? God is kind and compassionate. And if we pray to him, asking for that, to see Jesus more clearly, then wonderfully in his grace and his mercy, he will show us that. Let me pray for us as we finish. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we see your compassion here tonight, reaching out to those who are broken, who are lost, who are desperate in need. Lord, you do not look on people like that. You do not look on us when we feel that and say, I don't have time for them. We see a God, a Savior who says, I have compassion on them. Lord, you know what it is like to feel weakness and temptation. And Lord, we thank you. That means that we can come to you, Lord, with our problems, with our hurts, knowing that you have great compassion. You hear us as we pray to you. Thank you for that privilege. And Lord, just as we've seen from the Pharisees, the disciples, Lord, we confess too that we fail to see who Jesus is. Lord, perhaps we're distracted just by things going on in our lives, the, the busyness of it all, things that just feel out of control. Lord, perhaps we're blinded by already having our minds set up, made up who Jesus is. Lord, even perhaps over just our last day and week, we fail to see who Jesus is in the way that we've acted, the words that we've said, what we've thought. And so, Lord, we pray to you, asking for your forgiveness, for your mercy. We thank you that you are quick to give it. You are slow to anger. And, Lord, we praise you that you are the one who gives sight to the blind. You work by your Holy Spirit to, to show us who Jesus is. Lord, please do work in our hearts to show us all the more. Lord, we're perhaps we're here tonight or watching online. And this is the first time we're really thinking about who Jesus is. Lord, we pray that you would open up our eyes, that we might see Jesus more clearly, that we might see not just a Jesus on a stained glass window or history books, but just see a Jesus as a real person who has come to know us, to save us as our, our Messiah. Lord, we will see that in this next section in your word, in Mark's gospel. And Lord, we pray just as we close tonight, Lord, please do give us sight to see. We are sorry for our blindness, for the way that sin blinds us, the ways that we push you away. Help, Lord, help us to shake that off, to get rid of it in our lives, and that we might look at your word and see you more clearly and join and enjoy the contentment that you bring. Life to the full in your name. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.